Here's how advertising and engineering created the second largest city in the country, with pretty words and one really long canal. At the turn of the 20th century, new towns out west advertised themselves not just for vacations, but for permanent residents. And no city took self-promotion more seriously than Los Angeles. By 1913, it was the fastest growing city in America. But the never-ending promotion hid some serious questions. Who got to be a part of the city of the future? And how could a valley surrounded by desert support such a large population? Advertising Western expansion was not a new thing in the 1900s, but Angelinos made boosting their city a way of life. With help from the LA Chamber of Commerce, promoters flooded the East Coast and Midwest with pamphlets promising fine weather, economic opportunity, and abundant land. The scale of these efforts is truly shocking. By some estimates, Omaha, Nebraska received 125,000 pieces of LA propaganda in 1898 alone. And LA was promising the moon, or the sun in this case. Take this brochure from Illinois. In this grand country, we have the tallest mountains, the loveliest flowers, the finest fruits, the purest air, and the most genial sunshine in North America. The Los Angeles propaganda machine was in full swing. Residents went so hard on promoting their city that it became a national joke. But it was working. In 1880, LA had a population of 11,000. By the early 1920s, it grew to over 1 million. If you're showing up in Los Angeles in 1922 from Illinois or Alabama, you're looking at bungalow homes with lawns that are green and more and more and more of them. And that's the future you see for yourself. And that's the future everyone in Los Angeles tells you that you get to have. But it turns out all those brochures and pamphlets were papering over some serious issues in the city. Promoters made Los Angeles seem like a land of opportunity for all, but this wasn't totally true. LA advocates had a very particular vision of the new residents they wanted. White, English speaking, and preferably wealthy. One editorial got to the truth of it. We are not compelled, as in most Eastern cities, to set aside 20 to 30% as speaking little or no English and caring nothing for American institutions. As was often the case, the American dream had some qualifiers. There's racial segregation in law and in practice. There's violence meted out to non-whites. So it's not an alchemy of fulfillment and happiness that spreads to everybody. At the same time, the city's rapid growth threatened to destroy it. Early on, Los Angeles relied almost exclusively on the LA River for water. By 1905, it was clear that the river couldn't support the hundreds of thousands of new settlers flooding into the city. Led by self-taught engineer William Mulholland, Los Angeles built a 200-mile-long aqueduct that would provide enough water for 2.5 million people. But it still wasn't enough. So in 1922, Mulholland began plans for the St. Francis Dam, setting the stage for one of the worst disasters in California history. Two years after construction, the dam failed, killing more than 400 people. Behind every ad is a real product with real flaws. 100 years later, drought and climate change continue to pressure LA's water supply. How dry will Los Angeles be in the future? It depends on what actions we take now. But the grass can only be greener on the other side if you find a way to water it. What would an over-the-top advertisement for your city look like? Let us know in the comments. Want to learn about how LA's race for water caused one of the biggest disasters in California history? Watch American Experience's new documentary, Flood in the Desert.